Hey everyone, it's Beverly Hallberg. Welcome to a special pop-up episode of She Thinks, your favorite podcast from the Independent Women's Forum where we talk with women and sometimes men about the policy issues that impact you and the people you care about most. Enjoy. I'm your host, Ellie Kohanim, visiting fellow at Independent Women's Forum and former deputy envoy at the United States State Department. I'm so pleased to have with me today in this conversation Nazanin Ansari, who is publisher and editor of Kahan London and Kahan Life. She's a trustee of the Foreign Press Association in London, and she was elected to join its governing and served as president, vice president, and organized the symposium, Women as Agents of Change. Nazneen has also co-edited the Foreign Policy Center's Iran Human Rights Review, and uh, she is just uh, one of the most sought after people on this important conversation we're going to have today about the status of women in Iran today, but also we're going to cover um, what life was like for Iranian women prior to the 1979 revolution. And, uh, and so with that, and without any further ado, I'm so happy to welcome Nazanin Ansari to our edition of the, of, uh, the IWF podcast. Nazanin, so wonderful to have you. Thank you so very much, Ellie, for your kind invitation. And may I first start by wishing you a happy Nowruz. It's a new start, spring, and it's a new year for, for Iranians. And what you have done, uh, uh, creating, you know, spreading the and echoing uh, uh, the history of Iranian women and uh, uh, the developments in Iran is really exemplary. And I'm really proud to know you, Ellie. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, uh, I was talking about the history of Nowruz, which goes back to, uh, you know, 2,500 years ago. And when we look back uh, uh, to the history of women, Iranian women, uh, we can see that, and this is based on tablets that were found under the Persepolis, the palace of the Achaemenian kings. Uh, and, uh, what, uh, and they are in uh, the University of Chicago. And what we have learned from these tablets about the role of women in ancient Persia and since is fascinating. Um, they were not only respected, but they were considered equals of, uh, to, to men. And they could own land, conduct business, uh, businesses. They received equal pay and they could travel uh, on their own. And in the case of uh, royal women, um, they could hold their own council meetings and even choose their husbands. And uh, we know that, for example, Shahnameh that was written is uh, considered like the Canterbury Tales. It's a fa uh, about the history of Iran. The women of Shahnameh, for example, they choose their men. They fight in wars. Uh, and, uh, for example, women... Uh, even during the Achaemenid period, they were they could serve in the military, and there is written uh, and physical evidence about that. And also in the workforce in those days, uh, they were supervisors and managers, and there's record of highly paid female supervisors receiving larger amounts of wine and grain for overseeing uh, men working and even like pregnant women received higher wages as did new mothers. So uh, all of these, um, the history and what was happened to the Iranian uh, Persian women, unfortunately, we do have a lot of <clears throat> recorded history up to the end of the Sassanid period, but with the conquest of Iran by the invading, you know, by the spread of Islam throughout the world, uh, what happened that was a lot of our libraries, books were burnt, and the history that we, uh, there's not a lot of recorded history um, uh, until very recently. I mean, we know a lot of our history through the Greeks and the Romans uh, rather than through our own books. But what we do know is that any change that was brought out, uh, happened, were usually were brought out by women in the royal households. And this continued until, for example, we come to the era of uh, Al-Fast 
forward to 1906 when we see this shift in Iranian history and political history. Because until 1904, Iran was ruled by a constitution like a divine right of kings. Uh, Isn't that incredible, right. Nazanin? So, yes. Nazanin, I want to I want to make sure that our uh, listeners understand this rich and ancient Persian history, which you just outlined. Uh, and so, you're talking about an ancient culture, an ancient people, and uh, and so thousands of years ago, what you just described is uh, a, a country where women had rights and certainly exercised power. And so, so now you're fast forwarding to 1903, where um, we start to see the rise of monarchy in Iran. Is that correct? And and if, if oh, you can tell us a little bit about about you know what were the changes that took place uh, in that time period, and I think also under the Shah Pahlavi uh, dynasty, if you can talk a little bit about the status of women then. Yes. You know, the history of monarchy and kingship goes back to thousands of years, you know, of recorded history. Uh, the, uh, you know, what we do have from the first empire is like around 2,500 years ago. But what happened in 1904, we see a shift from the rule, uh, I mean, the rule of the king by divine right, where we had it in Europe as well. But we see, because during the Qajar period at that time, in the, uh, who ruled Iran for 300 years, they really Europeanized Iran in the sense that they loved Europe. And so they opened the doors to Europe. There was travel. Nasser al-Din Shah came to the court of Queen Victoria. There are books in uh, Britain, uh, in UK I found, written in a Cockney accent, describing the day the Shah came to visit Queen Victoria and how he was dressed. So the Qajars opened the door and modernization and all those uh, thoughts uh, and philosophies started uh, coming uh, to Iran. So we, uh, it is the age of reason a lot of people talk about in Iran. And so there is this massive movement to take away the role of, you know, the divine role of the king and give give the rights to the uh, people. So we have the constitutional revolution in Iran, which was which is, was founded actually on the age of reason in Europe by Voltaire, uh, the age of enlightenment. And so uh, what happened? These ideas came, and. Uh, there were a lot of Qajar princesses. Uh, we have uh, recorded uh, the history that they were becoming, they were active in the constitutional revolution. They were very active at, in social work, in writing books, uh, but at, at, at a state level, from a government perspective, the rules and the laws were still very much uh, based on Sharia laws. So even when, because the constitutional revolution happened and the rule of the divine king was thrown away and given uh, you know, to, the, to the people, legitimacy then became transferred from the people to the king during the constitutional revolution, still the women lost a lot because it was the clerics who actually um, you know, controlled the society at that time. And they really didn't uh, allow any breathing space uh, for women, but women continued at the street level, at the um, grassroots level, through education, through writing, uh, I mean, uh, to spread. At the first, uh, when Reza Shah came from the Qajar period, uh, the Qajars uh, were uh, overthrown, if you would like, it changed. Actually, the last king abdicated and did not want to come back to Iran. And uh, power was transferred uh, to a co- young Cossack commander of the army who was by then a uh, prime minister called Reza Khan. Reza Khan was known uh, as a very modernizer in the sense that with the modernization of Reza Shah was structured on not only education, but also uh, bringing uh, uh, roads, uh, also secularization. For example, one of the things that happened on the Reza Shah was that the justice system and uh, the 
uh, was uh, transferred, religious courts were abolished uh, and they were replaced by civil courts. And then marriage contracts for women no longer had to be registered with the cleric, but they would be registered with the Ministry of Justice. And he encouraged the education so, Nazanin, of women. May I yes. ask, at this yes. point, do you think this was a turning point for the status of women, where you see uh, Reza Shah, Pahlavi, uh, westernizing Iran, importing these kind of European ideas, and changing uh, the legal system? Do you, do you see this as a turning point for the status of women? Yes, especially because, you know, we were talking about how power women women, powerful women were always uh, in royal households, were princesses, were that. Reza Shah had a daughter who was the twin sister of, his, uh, of uh, Muhammad Reza Shah, Princess Asha, and a lot of, uh, you know, Iranian historians, and she's known to have been the tough one. She's the one that, uh, you know, there is a story that she visited... Um, Stalin, after Russia, uh, after the Soviets had uh, invaded north of Iran, and Stalin had given her 40 minutes, uh, you know, audience. She ended up staying for three hours. She was yeah. a very, and she herself compared herself uh, as a black, she wished she could be a black leopard in one of her, uh, her uh, you know, uh, writings in her book, faces in the mirror, looking into the eyes of her enemies and uh, striking free. But she was the biggest champion. So already what started under Reza Shah, which was uh, the encouragement for the education of women, for the first schools for uh, girls, primary school was started in 1907, actually it was before uh, Reza Shah, but, but by the time Reza Shah came, he had brought in like um, this government was helping uh, to not only provide financial support to women to study abroad, but they also set up teachers training colleges and um, uh, they were admitted to university, Tehran University, and education became compulsory, you know, in 1944. Uh, but so education opened a lot of inroads uh, for women, and this continued until uh, we come to the really blossoming uh, of the Iranian women's movement. I think you could say it's in 1963. I mean, it, it is in the 1960s. And basically, it started with the White Revolution. Um, I, I, I'm not sure you were not born then. I, were, I had just been born, uh, Ellie. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a White Revolution of the Shah for his people. And it was based, uh, it changed the economic structure of Iran in the sense that until then, uh, land ownership and proprietorship was very much based on big landowners, and it was then, if you would like to compare it to European ways, Western, it was more like a feudal system. So, um, uh, Mohammad Reza Shah, Reza Shah's son, uh, brought in this uh, 1960s White Revolution that actually three of the points of the White Revolution concern uh, women. And we see uh, that, uh, for example, they started to have uh, a special uh, court uh, for women, education. Um, they, uh, uh, and one of, the, uh, and uh, so by 1963, by 1963, women were given the right to vote and to enter office and to be able to have, and this was all against, uh, you know, uh, opposition from the clerics, but still they were able to push this through. But at the same time, in, in the 1960s, they established the Women's Organization of Iran, uh, which was a non-profit grassroots organization, and it worked mainly uh, uh, through volunteers, educating uh, women for change to work for, towards securing economic and independence uh, for women. And 
it tried to be also in the spirit of, remain in the spirit of Islam, but uh, it worked uh, through local branches and it had literacy classes, vocational training, counseling. And so women entered the diplomatic corps. By 1968, there was a minister of education and she was the first woman to hold a cabinet position. By 1969, the judiciary was open to women, um, and Shirin Abadi, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, was one of, the, one of the women who became the judges. And women were elected to town, city, and uh, uh, county councils. But what is very uh, interesting is, uh, Eli, and this is what made me cry uh, when I was revisiting the history, uh, we come to Family Protection Law of 1967, which actually gave women the right, uh, rights for their own sake in the family life, and they were no longer under the men's authority within the family. And um, uh, they, there were laws that provided for childcare in workplace, full-time benefits for half-time work for mothers of children up to the age of three, and equal pay for equal work. And uh, by 1975, the United Nations General Assembly had proclaimed 1975 as International Women's uh, Year. And at the World Conference uh, on Women uh, in Mexico City, you know, they selected an Iranian woman to chair uh, the, uh, the, the consultative committee for the World Conference of that year. And this was the first world meeting that devoted uh, the subject of women at the level of government delegations. And the chair of this, woman, uh, of this uh, committee was Princess Ashraf. Again, wow. we see, uh, you know, not only women working from the grassroots, but also governments also being a supporter and an encourager and an, uh, um, empowering women to do so. But what made me, you know, really emotional is that not only within a few months of the Mexico conference, nearly two thirds of the heads of state and governments of the world had approved a declaration on International Women's Year. Uh, the declaration that had been brought to the attention of the world community by an Iranian woman. And by 1976... This is, this is fascinating. This is fascinating yeah. to hear. And, uh, and so I think for our audience, um, you know, just to recap, so, so you're talking about, you know, from the 1960s till 1975, this tremendous... Yeah. Uh, leap forward for women in Iran uh, following, you've got the White Revolution, which um, which kind of uh, re reframes the economy of the entire country, and then you've got the, the legal structure put into place where women are protected, women are given equal status, you said equals, equal pay for equal work, mm -hmm. And so, and so, and then you, you lead up to this 1975 international forum where it's an, inter, mm -hmm. an Iranian woman who's taking this leadership role. And, uh, and so, Nazim, the way that I look at uh, Iranian history, uh, here we are at 1975, we're four years away from what would become the, the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly that, that then becomes a complete shift in the history of Iran and the status of women. So before mm -hmm. we get to the revolution, I just want mm -hmm. to stay on this pre-revolutionary moment. Um, mm -hmm. so, so what do you describe the life of an average Iranian woman? What, what was life like then? Because I think when we describe what life is like now, it will be a huge contrast. And I would love for our audience to understand that. Could you tell us a little bit about what, what was life like for an average Iranian woman before 1979? And maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your history and where you were during this time. Yes. Um, I'll tell you the story of my grandmother, actually, because she was born under Reza Shah. Sure. And um, she, she walked out on her husband because she couldn't put up with, you know, usually Iranian men 
uh, where, you know, they could have not only four wives, but over like 99 uh, concubines, even maybe more. Um, but so she could not put up with it. She left, but because she left, she lost <clears throat> um, guardianship of her children. So the children were given to their grandfather to be brought up. My, she worked, she went, although she had been educated at that time under Reza Shah, uh, primary school was open in 1907 for girls. But afterwards, it was either you would receive education at home or, you would, uh, or there would be no other education. She had received education and she had become a working woman. So by 19, but as I was growing up, I would see my grandmother every day while she would come and stay with us, wake up in the morning, you know, do her exercise, and then walk to work where she worked for the newly established, um, uh, it was called Doru Pash, where all the medicines, all, it's still there actually, uh, where uh, over 80% of Iranian medicine is homegrown and homemade. Um, so, and uh, this organization, this institution had just started then. So she would go and work there. But also, uh, you know, when she would go and read newspapers, she could read newspapers that were about women who had joined uh, stories about women who had joined the military, who had become pilots, who were teaching at university, uh, who had become judges, uh, who owned businesses, but who more than anything else aspired. Around uh, my grandmother had a friend of hers who was also a single woman um, because of she wouldn't put up with the strict uh, traditional ways that Iranian men in those days would treat their women. But um, she had lost all her money, but she started sewing and she had set up um, uh, uh, sewing um, in, uh, in her, at her home, but then it became bigger. She was employing seven other women and it, she had become an entrepreneur herself. Um, there was also my teachers at school that I went to uh, who were uh, very well, you know, although I went to a uh, school uh, for high school, uh, uh, to an international school, but my elementary school in Iran, I was born in a year that because, as I uh, you know, mentioned, we had the first minister who was part uh, education minister, a new curriculum had been brought and instituted in, uh, uh, for education in Iran. And um, a lot of women had become teachers. Uh, there were uh, women also in parliament, um, but there were also women who really were into arts. I mean, um, artists, uh, writers, uh, it was, a period of flourishing. I mean, girls had aspirations. They, personally, me, I wanted to enter into public service. I wanted to go back to Iran to serve. Uh, it was a period of a lot of energy. The school I went to, elementary school, I later found out that, you know, I was going to school with um, boys and girls. You know, I went to a mixed uh, elementary school. Uh, it was one of the first mixed schools um, and with children that now later after the revolution I found, and I'm still in touch with them, they didn't know I was a Shia or that I was a Sufi, that I would go to the mosque and I didn't know they were Baha'is or they were Jewish or they were Armenian. It was an entirely different uh, world. And we only, it was, it was truly heavenly, Ellie, it was. And, and, and so Nazanin, I want, to, I want to capture one phrase that you just said, which is girls had aspiration and women yes. were achieving. And so, so this is, you know, so here is the picture of, of, this, of women pre-1979 revolution. And now I want to take our listeners there. So uh, you have the, the 
protest movement, which leads to the rise of the radical Islamist uh, revolution, the 1979 revolution in Iran. You have the Ayatollah Khomeini taking power, and, uh, and brutally so. And now once they take power, we start to see the status of women uh, in an almost immediate decline. Um, and so now, Zanin, if you could, if you could let our viewers or listeners know um, what, you know, what happened after the revolution. And then I would love for us to, to talk about what's happening today on the streets of Iran to women. Yes. You know, as I mentioned before, you know, the civil code of Iran was uh, updated to include rights for women. And this was through the Family Protection Law in 1967, 1975, giving us all these rights. Um, and certainly in 1968, we had uh, Mrs. Parcel become Minister of Education. With the revolution happening overnight, everything changed. They, they just, they erased the 1979-67, uh, you know, legal provisions, and immediately overnight, the civil uh, code of Iran switched back to 1931 and the Sharia. So suddenly, it, overnight, we became worth half of a man, rights of a man. I mean. Um, Iran's constitution after the, and before I move into the constitution, this is a symbolic story because Mrs. Parsa, the first female minister of Iran, was executed and her, uh, her crime, they told her she's a prostitute. That's why she was hanged for prostitution. Why? Such a because horror. she opened education for women. So it's it's a horror, and I and I know that this and this uh, charge, this false accusation uh, against women, uh, has continued to this day, where they uh, where they have this uh, accusation of facilitating corruption and prostitution, quote unquote, for uh, for merely not wearing a hijab, um, and so it's it's kind of shocking to hear that it started this attack on womanhood. It started with. Uh, with the very first uh, minister in Iran who was a woman. Yes. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, by 1978, before the revolution, women had convinced the government to resolve all governmental, economic, social, and decision-making requiring, requiring cabinet approval to be cleared for gem- gender impact. Overnight, Everything changed. Mrs. Parsa was executed. Iran's civil code went back to 1930s uh, on the principles of Sharia. And in 1979, for example, when all countries were signing UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, Iran did not sign it. The Islamic Republic did not sign it, even though this was one of the conventions, one of the things that start, was started in 1975. So on every international level, national level, there was a whole shrouding of Iranian women's achievements. And so that's why, you know, um, today in the World Economic Forum annual report, on the gender gap, Iran ranks 148 out of 153 countries um, as far as gender gap with only Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Congo having a bigger overall gender gap. And that, that's, a, that's, as, a sad, that's a sad yeah. list to be on. And I have to say, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, Nazneen, I think what you're saying is that uh, basically following the Islamic revolution, women uh, went backwards rather yes. than going forwards in Iran. And so, I, so now I want to I take our listeners to the status yes. of women today. 
Um, yeah. You and I were you and I were on a different conversation where we described yeah. what's happening in Iran as gender apartheid, and gender apartheid is very strong language. So I'm hoping that you can explain why do we use this language? Why is there actual gender apartheid taking place in the Islamic Republic of Iran today? Yes, you know when you look at uh, the constitution. And when you look at uh, the, legal, uh, the legal framework of uh, the Islamic Republic, you will see that if it's, uh, let's start with the Constitution. Um, Article 20 of the Constitution, it says that all men and women have equal protection of the law and all human, political, economic, social, and cultural rights as long as it's in conformity with Islamic criteria. That, that goes back to Sharia law. Article 21, and this is the only article in the Constitution which explicitly mentions women's rights, it provides that, I quote, the government must ensure the rights of women in all respects in, is in conformity again with the Islamic criteria. So it is the duty of the government to impose, uh, in, you know, uh, um, unequal um, laws on women in Iran. You know, I mean, that's uh, it's because it's the principle of Islam. And thus, Article 21, it strictly limits the rights of women according to the principles of Islam. And that it ensures that every dialogue about women's rights must be understood in the religious context. This is the problem of the Constitution. If we are ever going to have equality with men and have women's rights in Iran, this, these two articles have to be changed. Now let's go back to the Civil Code. As I uh, mentioned, the Civil Code went back to ni- over- overnight at the time of the revolution. It went back to the 1930 civil uh, code rights, uh, civil code that is based on Sharia. So it's, um, girls are, uh, can be married at the age of 13, unless their, the, her guardian approves the marriage and the competent court determines that the marriage is in her best interest. And in this case, they can be married younger. And, um, A boy can be married uh, at 15. Um, Although women are considered citizens and they can vote, but they can only be elected to certain of offices that, you know, are according to the Islamic criteria. Uh, Women cannot, uh, you know, uh, study at university in all the topics. You know, uh, one thing I have to add, Ellie, after the revolution, that wasn't only ba- the bad thing that happened to us. We had the cultural revolution on top of the Islamic revolution. For two years, the universities were closed. All Western educated professors were, you know, um, uh, cleared from universities. So women were subjected to a cultural revolution as well. And there were a lot of um, areas of study that women could not study. For example, at the time of the revolution, I was in the United States and I was studying public affairs and government. That was one of the areas that was banned for women. So even according to the Iranian laws after the revolution, I wasn't my, able to study if I had been in Iran what I had wanted to study. One of the only areas that was open for them was writing and journalism. That's why a lot of women went to into journalism. And we, uh, they say, uh, despite the intentions of the regime, you have this brilliant younger Iranian generation going out into the, you know, into the bosom of the Iranian society and bringing out the stories, and also women, mothers, passing on the story, what I told you today, these stories were passed on from mothers, grandmothers, to mothers, to daughters, and they were carried forth. So uh, 
what we see today in, in the Iranian women's movement. And if I may go on another tangent at a time when there's so much money and investment in the studies and conferences for the role of Middle Eastern women and not so much for Iranian women, yet we see in Iran uh, this voice of the Iranian women, you know, refusing to be shut up. And we hear it nowadays in the news, whether it is the streets, uh, the girl of the streets of the revolution that they went, they took, uh, you know, they took out their hijab and stood there with a white flag or whether those that of uh, the White Wednesday campaign of Masi Ali Nejad, they are shouting. But we need, I think, what it has been lacking until now, and I'm not sure it's going to be better because these past 40 years has been a dearth of any, you know, fundamental uh, appreciation of what women had and what women lost simply because of the politicization uh, of the women's movement by the Islamic Republic. So, Rosalyn, I think, I think yes. if I may, I think this is a yes. perfect transition because yes. um, I want to ask you one last question. And yes. so before you get to it, I want to ask this question. What yes. do you think women in the West, uh, and so that would be American women, European women, and uh, Iranian women in the diaspora, but specifically American and European women, many of whom consider themselves feminists. What do you think they can be doing to support the women in Iran who are facing these horrific conditions uh, where they're not, you know, even second-class citizens, they're third-class citizens, they're, they're facing uh, gender-based uh, violence, they are um, being imprisoned and tortured for the mere fact of leaving the house without putting a veil on them, which is mandated by the state and not because they want to be wearing a veil. What can Western so-called feminists do to support these women? Um, thank you, Ali. Uh, we, need, uh, we need to learn from each other and share our experiences, and we need to have access to best practices uh, in social relations, information technology, political interaction. But at the same time, I think it's important that the values and the visions and you know, the solutions that Iranian women find to be represented in international forums where you know, models are developed, discourses determined, and resources are allocated. Unfortunately, since 1978, these have been uh, the, the views that have been expressed in those international forums have been represented by the Islamic Republic. And that has been an anomaly as far as women's rights is concerned. And uh, also supporting women's aspirations for gender equality, political participation should become synonymous uh, with the aims of any government. Uh, that is, you know, that wants modernization and development. But at the same time, there are certain things that national foreign companies can do. Uh, you know, they can, for example, and these are some, some uh, uh, recommendations made by Human Rights Watch, actually, that they have to adopt anti-discrimination policies that ban all forms of discrimination when they go in workplace, uh, when, they, when companies enter into negotiations or relations, Western companies with companies set up in Iran, there has to be that uh, intent and adoption of anti-discrimination policies and that there should be, you know, like uh, ensure that there is a, a gender equality in their hiring. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's a lot that United Nations can do, and the European Union uh, to ensure that the voices of Iranian women and what they have been fighting for, you know, it is not fair to be reflected because that is how it is, you know, at the street level, at the community level in Iran and in the hearts of Iranian women as well. So sisterhood international, I would say. Absolutely. Well, I think that is an incredible note for us to end on in honor of Women's History Month. 
It was truly a pleasure to have with us Nazanin Ansari, publisher and editor of Kehan London. And uh, I thank everyone for joining us on this She Thinks podcast. Thank you.